Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The text for this morning's message is the Gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 5. In our text today, Jesus teaches on four points of the law. This is set in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus has a lot more to say than just these four points, but our text here restricts us to these. And the teaching of our text is striking. The teaching of our text today is dangerous, and it is fearful. Jesus here takes the time to explain that the simple human understanding of the law is not sufficient. It never, ever goes far enough. Essentially, he is saying that if you think that you can fulfill the law on your own account, you think something wrong. And you better think again. In particular, Jesus is addressing the attitude of the Pharisees in his day, but he is also addressing the perceptions of the common people. The Pharisees had a high opinion of themselves with regard to their ability to fulfill the law, to interpret it and to fulfill it. The population, they also thought very highly of the Pharisees and they even devoted themselves to the Pharisees' teaching. But Jesus is here and he is here to tell the Pharisees and all the people that they are just as fallible as anybody else. That no one, whether you be a Pharisee or anyone else, has fulfilled the law to the extent that God demands. And Jesus is God. We must be careful. Sometimes we find ourselves believing in ourselves. And sometimes we find ourselves also believing in someone other than Jesus for our salvation. It won't work for us either. No one else is good enough. Faith in Jesus is the only faith that saves you from your sin. Christ's four areas of teaching for today deal with anger and lust, divorce, and keeping your word. And in no instance do we all fulfill God's expectations? We sin, and we also affect sin in other people's lives. I'm often asked as a pastor, is it possible for, for us to be angry and not, and not to sin? The short answer is, in sinful humanity, no. It is impossible. Everything that we do is tainted by sin, even our anger. We do not have all the right perspectives in which to have holy anger. But God, He can be angry without sinning, and He has been. He has done it, and He can do it, because He is the one who does have the perfect perspective. In our lives, we do have authorities. We have our parents. We have our government authorities. These are people who can be angry, but they are not perfect. But Jesus, but God, is perfect. This passage refers to being angry with your brother. This assumes an equal status. And I think that this status can exist within the family as defined by chromosomes and DNA, but it can also be defined by us as a family, as a people gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus wants us as brothers and sisters to deal with our differences without being angry. He wants us to come to reconciliation quickly, and sometimes that means asking for forgiveness, which is hard. And sometimes that means giving forgiveness, which is also hard. How often have we been angry with our brothers and sisters? How often have we insulted or called someone close to us, close as family, a fool? How often have we refrained from asking for forgiveness or extending forgiveness? Jesus says that these actions, 
are the same as murder. He doesn't say that they are like murder. He doesn't say that they fall short of the action of murder, but they're almost there. He does say that they are the same as murder. And in God's realm, murder requires a penalty. And that penalty is death. And we have all fallen short because of our fallen shortness. Because of our sin, we deserve that penalty. We deserve that penalty of death to be put into prison until all the debt is paid. And only death pays that debt. But it's too much. We can't pay it. What are we to do? How can our righteousness be what is necessary in the eyes of God? Jesus then very abruptly uh, ends his discussion of anger. Then he moves on to another topic of sin. Jesus addresses the issue of adultery. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees would have said that they do not commit adultery. They would say, I've never slept with anyone. Out. I've never gone out and, and done something against my wife that I shouldn't do. I have always followed the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. How many of us would say the same? How many of us would say, I've never committed adultery? But Jesus ups the ante. He redefines adultery to the nth degree. He says that if you look at a woman with lustful intent, you have already committed adultery with her. Even if it stays in your mind and your thoughts, you have dwelt upon it, thought about it, you have already sinned. If your heart strives after a woman in a sexual way, you have already sinned. Pornography certainly fits within this definition. If you participate in pornography, you have stepped out on your spouse or even your future spouse. That's an easy thing to see. It is evil. Pornography turns sex into meaninglessness. It takes from sexuality what the Lord intended for it to be between one man and one woman, between husband and wife. But Jesus takes it even further than that. If you see a woman in a magazine or someone just walking down the street and your thoughts turn sexual, you have already broken the commandment that the Lord has given. And you have broken it just as completely as if you had physically acted upon those sexual thoughts. What does Jesus say we should do because of our sin? This is what he says. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Right away, we see the penalty for adultery is the same as that for murder. It is to be thrown into hell. If you want to avoid hell, then before you sin, you should cut off the body parts that would cause you to sin. A couple problems with this. First problem is we need our body. To cut off our limbs or to cut the parts of our body off, that would reduce us. We need our bodies. God made us with bodies and we need them. The second is this, if we were to eliminate the body parts that cause us to sin, what's left? The horse is already out of the barn. Let's be honest, the standard that God sets for this command is so high that if you are a mature person, even if you are a young person, you have already committed this sin and you deserve the penalty. What are we going to do? What is the way out? Hell fire is coming, and there's nothing that we can do about it. And then Jesus goes on. He doesn't pause. He just goes on to the next thing, the next law, the next accusation, the next onslaught. He comes at us again. This time it's about divorce. He starts out talking about the practice of 
giving a certificate of a divorce. Essentially, this is the same thing that we have today. If you wanted to divorce your wife, you get a certificate that says you're divorced and it's official, it's legal. This had to be done. This had to be done to protect the woman especially, who likely did not have any resources of her own and would need to remarry and without the legal document, could not. This was supposed to be an act of compassion, but in fact, it was not an act of compassion. In fact, it is an act that is contrary to the will of God, contrary to the way God made marriage and instituted it. He makes clear that the only legitimate reason for divorce is on the ground of sexual immorality. A legal piece of paper produced by humanity does not trump what God says about marriage and about what marriage is. No-fault divorce is contrary to the will of God. If we think that divorce is legitimate because the government gives us a piece of paper, we have another thought coming to us. And just because someone falls out of love is not a good enough reason in God's economy of life to divorce wife or husband. In fact, the piece of paper, the truth of marriage, it is not changed. The context of marriage is not changed. The reality of what marriage is designed to be is not changed. God's idea of what marriage is is not changed. The standard is so strong that if a divorced woman, according to a piece of paper and not according to God, remarries, then both the woman and the new husband have committed adultery. Did you catch that? That's a tough thing. That's a tough standard. How many of us in this room are affected by the reality of divorce? How many people even in this room have had a divorce for reasons less than sexual immorality? How many of us are born simply because of a parent or a grandparent in our lives who had committed adultery and who had left a marriage without rightness? What are we to do as a people about this sin? How can we make it right? Everything has changed. Because of divorce, our whole lives, the whole scheme of life is changed. We can't turn the clock back. There's nothing that we can do to make the right wrong. Excuse me, to make the wrong right. The penalty is death. The penalty is destruction and hell. There's nothing we can do to fix it. Here again, Jesus does not stop to give any kind of comfort. He gives no release. He simply goes on. Simply goes on to talk about another sin. To talk about another accusation. Jesus says that we should take no oaths. To put our hand on the Bible and say that I will tell the truth. That's not good enough. What we say. What we always say. Must always be true. Every word that comes from your mouth must be true, no matter what, all the time, every time, or it is a sin that is damnable. To say that I swear by God in heaven is tenuous, it is dangerous, because you have no power in heaven. To swear by God is to, is to suggest that you have some sort of authority or some sort of connection with God that allows you to do that. Really, can you say it? Is it possible for you to speak something without blemish whatsoever? Is it possible for you to do this, to speak in this way every time and at any occasion? If you ever speak something that is false, even if it's a mistake, it is a sinful act. It is possible for you to experience an event, to see something, to think that you saw something that, that you saw but not to have the whole perspective, to not have the whole understanding of the thing that you saw. And so you begin to talk about it. You talk about what you saw, but you don't have full understanding. And when you talk, you're not really telling the truth because you, you didn't see the whole picture. You didn't see all the connections. You didn't see all, everything that was going on in the context of the events. No, that is evil. 
You must let your yes be yes and your no be no, that whatever comes out of your mouth, it must be true. And if you've ever spoken a lie, you and me, you deserve death, the penalty of hell. Well, that's it. That's the end of the text. What do you think? Should I say amen? No. I heard a no. I'm glad I heard a no. <laughs> yes, we cannot stop here. There is something more that is going on. And we must think through these things. I tell you the truth. As we look at all of these laws that Jesus speaks about, every one of us should be shaking in our boots. It's that kind of message. But a friend of mine pointed out one day, who's speaking these words? It's Jesus. It's God. God chose not to leave us alone. God chose to come, to give us his word, to point out our sin, to point out our shortcomings, to point out how we have failed, and to point out how we can't do it ourselves, that we're not God of our own lives. We came to point out also that he is God of our lives. As a believer, as a believer in Jesus, as one who by faith trusts the Lord Jesus Christ for life and salvation, your sins are forgiven. You are free. You are free from the sins of your past. You need not fear the terror of the night or the judgment that is to come. As a believer in Jesus, your sins are covered because he came. Because he came and he preached, but more because he came and he died on a cross and shed his blood to fulfill all righteousness in your life. And now you are free. You are free. You are free from the sin and guilt that defines your past. You walk away from it. You are free. The guilt is taken away. Jesus has taken it from you. And now you are free. You are free to pursue life in the way that God has given it to you. Free to work on your relationships with your brothers and sisters so that there is forgiveness and reconciliation. You are free to daily set aside your sin and pursue an upright and moral life. You are free to work on your marriage, to struggle in that context. And you are free to speak the truth of God's love for people. You are free to do these things without fear of condemnation. Always, we come daily before the Lord, and by His Word we receive that forgiveness of sins that we need, that allows us to be free, that gives us the freedom we need. As God's children, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, we can pray and ask God to give us His Spirit to lead us at every turn, daily confessing our sins, receiving forgiveness, and doing the good that the Lord lays before us every day. And now I think I can. Now I think I can say, Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.